Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Fill in the Blanks. This is a really special episode because I am talking about something that is affecting so many of you, and that is homeschooling. Right now, we are at least three weeks for most everybody into lockdown, isolation, shelter in place. And that means that you're there, so many of you, with your children, everywhere from kindergarten all the way through high school. And most of the schools have let out for the year. And that means a lot of different things. And one of those is that you have become a teacher because homeschooling has become the order of the day. That's interesting because the people that have been teaching your child, your teen, are people that spent at least four years training to do what you're now expected to do with no training at all. These are people that were training your child in an environment that was designed for education. It was devoid of distractions. It was an educational environment with educational tools and materials. Everything that was set up to favor learning. And now you're teaching your child in an area that was not designed for learning. It's full of distractions. It was where they were supposed to be at ease, at home, relaxing, playing, interacting, socializing. And now those two worlds have mixed. And you are expected to, all of a sudden, overnight, know how to be an educator. And should that be happening? Probably not. But that's what the situation calls for right now. It's the best alternative we have to finish the school year so kids don't wind up with a partial year. And I have heard from so many parents that are saying, oh, my God, this is horrible. I've heard from parents that have four or five children all under 10, some of them going to different schools in different grades all with different curriculum and protocols, and they've only got one computer or no computer. In the L.A. Unified School District, two-thirds of the children are below the poverty level. Many of these homes don't even have a computer, but yet they're expected to take the children through the curriculum, complete their school year, and have them ready for next year, and parents are afraid their child is going to fall behind and never catch up. Now, my children are grown. They're out there. One of them has kids of their own, and he and his wife are homeschooling their kids, first and third grade. So I wanted to talk to some people on the educational side of this. I've talked to parents, and they've told me what their frustrations are, but I wanted to talk to some of the teachers. So I have three here. I've got Fran Moss. She's a principal of a school that is K through 8th grade in La Jolla, California. I have Sandy Glick. She's a teacher. She teaches juniors and seniors at Oak Hills High School in High Desert, California, and Amy Bonwell She's a teacher of AP Psychology, Hillcrest High School in Riverside, California. So these three are joining me today and hopefully are going to talk to us about how you guys can maximize your homeschooling, minimize the distractions, and get your kids as ready as possible for next year. So Fran, Sandy, Amy, I welcome all of you. We're on Zoom, so that means... Not everybody can talk at once, but I do want to have a conversation. Let me just start with you, Fran. Uh, I want to talk about some of the challenges. You were on a show the other day, and I was so impressed with everything you had to say that I had them, before you could even hang up, invite you to be on this podcast. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. That's, That's nice to hear, especially coming from you. Thank you. Well, Fran, where's your Dr. Phil mug? I want to see. They tell me you drink out of a Dr. Phil mug every day. I want to see it. You got it there? (laughs) Okay. All right. There it is. And it has coffee in it, not wine. Not yet. Okay. All right. Listen, you understand what these parents are up against. These parents are not professional teachers. And the schools, I have looked at some of the outlines the curriculum that the school has given the parents, and they are very impressive. They put the dots close together, 
they've made it very clear what is expected. So I think they've done a good job of giving the parents tools to work with. But what are the biggest challenges you're hearing from the parents? What's their biggest frustration? They're exhausted. Uh, they're frustrated. And they're overwhelmed. If they, those are the three, the best way I can explain it. Uh, they love their children. Their children respect them as parents, but they don't respect them as teachers, unfortunately. They have right. different people with their teachers and they do it with their parents. Is this a scheduled situation where the kids are supposed to plug in at, say, 8.30 or 9 o'clock and complete work in a certain timeline? Or is it just, here's the work, get it done during the day sometime? Uh, they do have scheduled uh-huh. meetings because our teachers are working together at our school, as are in a lot of the other schools, I'm sure, to make sure if you have multiple students in a home that there aren't uh, conflicting Zoom meetings in case there's a problem with devices. So some kids might have to uh, check into a Zoom meeting at 8 o'clock. Some might not have to until 10 o'clock. And then they receive instruction. And then they have assignments and they get the, some of those assignments aren't due till the end of the week. Some are going to be open ended. Some are done right there at the Zoom classroom. It's a very flexible uh, type of um, classroom setting. And it, it just um, depends on the teacher. The teachers will set them up whoever best fits the needs of their class. Yeah. Sandy, what are you hearing from your family, students and parents? What are you hearing from them in terms of their biggest challenges and frustrations? I would say that. My students are all high school kids, so we have a lot of face-to-face interaction. The struggles that I'm hearing is that they don't have that emotional connection. Um, They know they're gonna see me at 10 o'clock, and now they can't see me at all. Uh, When they, you know, going through something, not always educational, but personal, they don't have that person there for them. They're pretty prepared in my eyes for this online, especially in my class. They're on homeschool now. Do you still talk to your students? Do you talk to the parents? Or do you just look over the submissions that come in online? I'm, an, my door, my phone is open 24 seven. So I talk to my students all day long and parents. Um, I use the Google Meets and we, I've had a few discussion with parents of students if they're not turning in their work or just to let them know that I'm here if they need me. What do you talk to them about? You say you're on the phone all day long. What are you talking about? Are you talking about school work or are you talking about other things? Or are you talking about how to teach? What are you talking about? Well, a little bit of both. If uh, a student is struggling on one of my discussion questions, I'll help them out. But I did have a student contact me the other day and she says she misses the conversations with me because sometimes I guess at home she's not able to open up. And with me, she's able to. And she says, I need that to get through my year. Yeah. And do you talk to the parents much? Uh, Not to her parents, but to some of my other students' parents, yes, I do. Yeah. Now, Amy, you teach AP psychology. So this is an advanced course in a very abstract area. Are you still interacting with your students? Or is this pretty much a printed book learning experience for them? Because I can't imagine that parents would be really prepared to teach an AP psychology course. Absolutely, Dr. Phil. I definitely see that the parents struggle already throughout the year, just making sure that they know where their students are, where they're supposed to be, how they can support them. And through this process, I've noticed a lot of the parents also reasonably so are, are worried. They have a lot of money that they may have invested into multiple students at the school. Uh, for AP testing and other testing that would ultimately lead to, you know, their uh, college admissions. And it's just a really unique time, especially for our juniors and seniors with that. They're losing a lot of their social activities in addition to prepping for these tests, which they already were worried about. And the AP programs changed quite a bit to try to keep up with all of this as well. So some teachers have taught all of the content for the year already. Others have only gotten to certain subjects and not others, and then College Board decides to cut certain content that won't be tested on them. So lots of changes that not only the teachers are trying to adapt to and put into words for parents and teachers that they can understand and prepare, they're, it's just a very fluid situation right now. Well, Amy and Sandy, let me ask you two in particular, because you're, you're dealing with the older kids, 
What are you hearing from the kids that all of a sudden are now not going to have senior prom, graduation exercises, some of the big events they've worked for in school in terms of plays and recitals and things that they may have been preparing for for months and maybe looking forward to for years. How are they handling the disappointment of those things not being able to actually transpire? Um, Well, for my students, I I do have quite a few that are involved in multiple activities. Um, I run a mental health club. I also do a lot of field trips. Um, We were actually supposed to come see you, Dr. Phil, last month, so unfortunately we weren't able to do that. Um, I do a lot of hands-on learning. I was able to get my students into a program to go see Hamilton this year, and all of the field trips have been canceled, along with prom and other activities. But one way our school is trying to combat the stress and, and grief of dealing with losing these activities for so many students has been to just connect with them. We've had uh, teachers that have been going on parade in our district to go see students in their neighborhoods, uh, in their cars to practice social distancing. And uh, one of the things that we're currently working on in uh, my district, in my campus, is to create a video made by all of the teachers to give the students to remind them that all of those activities will be there for them when we return. Okay, that's good if they have something to look forward to. Sandy, how about you? Uh, I have had a lot of crying phone calls in the beginning, um, especially prom in graduation. But a notice came out on our website that as of now, we are not canceling them. So it's given them quite a bit of hope that we will be able to reschedule both the prom and graduation. We're not 100%, but if they are able to do it, I will be very grateful that my students get to still have that experience. And then, you know, my kids were really excited because I constantly tell them to check the school website. And when we got that notification, we had a lot of happy students. So how late would you push that? Would this happen as late as June, July, August? I mean, how far would you push that? I would push it personally as a parent or as a teacher. I will push it as far as we have to. But I don't know what the school is going to do. I'm just grateful that they're considering it. Fran, are you seeing the same thing with the younger kids, K through eight? I know they still have plays and recitals and programs that they're looking forward to that they've prepared for, I'm sure, for months towards the end of the school year. Are they disappointed in things that they're not getting to do? I actually uh, post a YouTube video once a week to uh, talk to the children and the parents. And one week ago, I posted a video saying, that these that sixth grade camp is not canceled. We will go as late as we have to. The teacher and I have already agreed that we'll go together with them. So if it goes even until August, we will take them. And the same with our eighth grade graduation. Those are huge events for these children. And so I let them both um, let them all know that those are not canceled. Definitely not canceled. We'll just we just have to wait and see until this social distancing is over, so they can celebrate the way they deserve to celebrate. Have any of the three of you had COVID-19? No. Fortunately. Okay. All three of you have been safe so far and not had it. Do you know of any of your students that have had it? No. Older Older siblings uh, that that did not go to our school, but they contracted it after we were already out. Okay. All right. A member of one of our campuses contracted it, but I haven't heard of any student cases yet. Okay, well, here's the thing that I want to give to parents through this conversation that we're having. Just assume that you're a parent that maybe you went to college, maybe you didn't, you've been out of school for a long time, and you've got two or three children, and all of a sudden you're in a shelter at home situation, and you're having to homeschool two or three children. How should they approach this? How do they go about this where they can be effective without going insane from the stress, pressure, and frustration? What's the mindset they should approach this with? You know, routine. I can't say enough about routine. Uh, Children thrive on routine. It provides them a sense of security and sameness, which is why a school setting works so well. Uh, So I encourage parents to have a routine for themselves as well for their children. You need to get up every morning and you need to make your bed just like you did when you went to school and with your children, your children went to school. You need to, I I follow a routine at home as an adult. So the children need to have some kind of a routine 
and they should be involved in the setting of that routine. Get their input as far as their daily schedule and with what they do, when, when they get up, when they make their bed, as long as it gets done, because they still need to have those responsibilities. This is not a free-for-all. This is absolutely not a free-for-all. It should not be. Amy, Sandy, do you guys agree that these children should get up and get dressed in the morning just like they were going to school and have a schedule to follow? I would absolutely agree um, because I believe you are elementary, right, Fran? Yes. So with high school, I'm preparing my kids to go out into the world, get a job, go to college. So I would say for them, yes, the schedule that they can set for themselves is great. But my biggest thing is the open communication between the parents and the student. And that the parent is on that grade book like no tomorrow. That's really, really important. And the last thing for the parents, I believe, is they got to remember that this is new for not only the teachers, but it's new for the students as well. And we have to work together as a team. The three of us, if we work together, I think we will sell through this great. I also think that everyone's very worried about content and making sure that the students are able to retain learning during this time for next year that builds on the following years. And while we're trying to do the best we can with that too, I think that it's really important to um, emphasize mental health and also to get the parents working with the students in a way that they're comfortable together. Um, Sometimes that might look like joining the Zoom meetings together or looking at the book together and working through it. But oftentimes, and what I found through the last couple of weeks, if I provide something that's fun to kind of use as a warm up for class, almost a a way to get their day started before they jump into a bunch of coursework, they can do fun things like scavenger hunts or look for mental health information that they can share with others. There's a lot they can do to try to work together as a family or journal their experiences since they're now primary sources. Uh, Definitely an interesting Mm -hmm. time to be learning history, especially. Yeah, there's a range of students. There are those students that are self-motivated, they're A students, and they have a thirst for knowledge, and they really want to learn and go to school. And then there are students like I was who just really did not like school, did not want to go to school. It looked like the clock had been frozen. I would sit there for two hours and look up and the clock had moved three minutes. And I'm like, oh my God, is this ever going to end? The experience is different with those two types of students. And I'm really wondering what advice you have for parents whose kids just really don't give a damn. I mean, honestly, I think back if my parents had tried to homeschool me and particularly up through what's now middle school, we called it junior high. When I got into high school, I was put in a, what they called a gifted and talented program. But until then, I was just in a regular school, which I read the textbook the day they gave it to me, cover to cover. And then after that, it was like, why am I here? I was so bored and had no motivation. What do you do with kids like that, particularly if they also have a bad attitude at home. I mean, they're not maybe rebellious. They have a bad attitude at home. How do parents get those children, teenagers, to sit down in front of a computer and work with them to get lessons done? You know, uh, Dr. Phil, I I taught both of my children when they were one in third grade and one in junior high. And the one in junior high was very much like what you were describing yourself as. And you realize, and as parents, you can't, Force it. You can't cram education down a child's throat. Uh, it's very social for them. The older they get, the more social it becomes. And these Zoom classes have been a godsend when they get to see their classmates, interact with their classmates. So providing some kind of uh, social uh, part uh, piece to that puzzle will help. And that's really over all the grades. Even the little TKers at our school, the four-year-olds, love seeing their classmates on the screen. So I think making sure you have that ability for them to uh, to encounter their classmates and their teacher on a regular basis will help. I wasn't thinking about that. So when you're in these Zoom sessions, there are other students in the same period. So if you're on at like 9 o'clock, there are a lot of students in that same session at 9 o'clock, right? Yes. Is that true with you guys as well, uh, Amy, Sandy? Same for me. 
yeah, we use Google Meet and there's a grid and they can all see each other. We used it for a staff meeting last week too. There were about 90 teachers trying to squeeze into one one screen. Yeah. Same here. And how long do you recommend a student be engaged in a in a lesson at a given time? 45 minutes, an hour, 30 minutes? How long should a parent expect a student to stay hooked up to completing an assignment? I break my class up into 15-minute increments usually. We have about 55-minute periods, and I see them all about an hour a day uh, for each period. And 15 minutes is just looking at my own experiences as well as research. It seems to show that students learn best when they're given just a very focused, short amount of time to gain some new information and then give them time to practice it. So if a parent expects a student to sit there for seven hours plugging away at a computer, it's not going to be practical and the teachers don't expect it either. So you do 15 minutes focused on new material, then what do you do for the next 10 or 15 minutes? Um, It's kind of fluid right now. I'm doing different things with my AP classes versus my regular U.S. history classes, and I also have a sociology class. So they're all doing very different things. The unifying uh, activities that I've been doing are trying to get them to journal, first of all, just to work through the process, understand what they're living through, and to be able to make connections to what's happening day to day in our learning like you normally would. Um, 15 minute lecture time for me, it could be anything from posting guided notes where they can do it on their own and then come to a Zoom meeting and talk about what they've learned. Or it may just be direct instruction. If I get on uh, screencast uh, video software or something like that, I can create videos that I can put out and then I can reuse those in the future. So trying to really manage what we're doing now to prepare for this potential long-term distance learning is helping me see what's working best for for kids too and, and cutting things down. Yeah. Sandy, how much of this falls on the parent in terms of explaining information, actually teaching new material to the student? Well, quite a bit uh, depends on what grade the student is in. Elementary, I would put a lot of time in the parents. Um, But when you're reaching high school, it's a lot of independent work. I would say that my students' parents, my students are not going to need their parents' help. Um, our first assignment was creating a cooking video, being, it, being able to edit the software, put it together. I included other subjects, history, science into my video, made it a little fun and um, did a little TikTok. And the students seemed to enjoy that a lot, but there was no parent interaction on that besides buying the groceries. Well, I think back to when I was in middle school. It was a new math, and you guys are too young to remember this, but they called it, I think, SMSG math. Does anybody remember that? No? Okay. Well, it was called SMSG math. It was a new math back in the olden times. And I bring this book home and show it to my parents, and they just gave me this steer-headed look, just like, mmm. They had no idea what I was talking about. And I really wonder if the parents now, if they come home and somebody hands them algebra, trigonometry, if one of my kids handed me that right now, I can't add two and two and get five every time. It's just I'm not good at that. I'm fine with like qualitative but not quantitative sciences. That's just not my thing. I don't know that I would be able to help a student in that regard. So I imagine some of these parents kind of feel like they're in over their head. You know, Dr. Phil, the student I was speaking to um, the other day with his parents, they did bring that to my attention. He's really struggling in math. And my suggestion to him was, YouTube is your best friend. On YouTube, you can put in a problem And a lot of professors will be on there doing their videos, explaining it detail by detail. Um, My daughter used the same thing that is in college, and it helped her a ton. Well, that's a good idea. Parents can, if they're stuck, you can find anything on YouTube from how to make oatmeal to changing a tire, right? So if you go look for it on YouTube, you can find somebody at a whiteboard or whatever working through an equation and explaining every little step so you can use that to substitute for you explaining it to your student, which is a great idea. 
you know, my uh, my teachers, the um, especially the upper grade teachers, middle school teachers actually have office hours where they have a Zoom meeting. And it's an open meeting for parents to come in and say, listen, I'm struggling with this with my child or the kids can come in and talk too. they'll have office hours for parents and then office hours for the students to come in as well. So they have an open time for that. Well, that is another great idea. So you have office hours for parents where they can come say, look, I'm lost on this about how to help them. Can you explain it to me so I can explain it to them? Or am I doing this right? Is this the best way to do this? So you're actually tutoring the parents to tutor the child. Yes, correct. Do you get a lot of activity? Do you have takers on that? Math and science and actually ELA too, literature also. Yes, especially in the middle schools because you know, the students are nervous about getting into the high school they want to get into. And so they're stressing over this. And we ha- so we have to be as, as sensitive to that as possible. Uh, we have to make sure that we're delivering what we promise we can deliver for these students. And uh, whatever help we can give to the parents, we'll give it to them. Those are two really important tools that's come up in this conversation that Maybe parents already know this, and I just don't, but if not, I would really encourage parents to do what we're talking about here. Number one, use YouTube to back you up. Maybe you look at it before you sit down with your student, or maybe you take them with you to YouTube and go through it together, number one. Number two is create an appointment with the teacher of a given subject for you so they can maybe tell you how to break the subject down so you can walk your student through it. Because you would think, well, if they can tell me, they can tell the student, so why don't I just have my kid talk to them? Well, because there's a method to the madness, and hopefully you can generalize it from one lesson to the next. If they tell you, here's how to break this short story down, or here's how to break this equation down, or here's what to look for in this lesson, then you'll know how to use that on the next one that you have to help them with. So having office hours for the parents seems like a really, really good idea to me. Do you guys do that, Amy and Sandy? Do you have office hours for parents? I do. Yes, I've got my schedule open anytime they need to contact us and definitely we'll do what we can. Yeah, that's great. Now, how big a deal do you guys think it is to find a place in the home to dedicate a space where they sit down and do their schoolwork rather than just flopping down on the couch and doing it. I'm a big one for having a well-lit, clean, clear space where you do nothing but schoolwork there and schoolwork's done nowhere but there. I'm big on dedicated space that is learning friendly. I'm 100% on that. I even have to do it in my home. I mean, I have this is where this is my office right now in my home. And this is where I work. And when I come here, I'm at work. And that's the child's, you know, a child, when they go to school, that's their job. That's where, that's where they work. So they, you know, maybe they can have some input into where that space is with some guidelines from their parents, but definitely. I've also been opening the conversation with my students who are college bound seniors that are getting ready to go off to college. Um, They're going to have to have some self-directed learning time once they reach college, and that's just around the corner. And so finding a space that they can dedicate, whether, you know, they end up in a dorm room in a couple of months or they're at home studying, they they really need that dedicated sanctuary for learning. Yeah, I think that's a really big deal. I mean, it always has been for me. And for parents that are curious about this, I can tell you from a cognitive efficiency standpoint, multitasking is a myth. (laughs) <laughs> multitasking as a myth. If you think they can watch their favorite TV show while they're doing their lesson, that is absolutely a myth. If you want efficiency, you have to stop everything else, focus on that one thing, get it done, do nothing but that, and get it over with. Go 100% at what you're doing, get it done, and then go watch your television show. That's what we have the ability to record these things for. You can watch them later, but multitasking does not work. It is not efficient. You don't want to do that. So it's definitely better to have a space where they do nothing but their work and do it. And you said 15 minutes at a time, Amy, when you were talking. What do you guys think, Sandy, Fran, what do you use for intervals before they need a break? With our TKers, we're about 15 to 20 minutes because they're just four. You know, they're little guys. Uh, Most of our classes go for about 45 minutes. 
And I know the beginning of the classes usually starts with, hey, how you guys doing? Sometimes just kind of to talk and chat with one another. And the class ends that way also. And then there, there is definitely active, direct teaching going on for the remainder of the time. And, you know, we have, we have some issues in the beginning with kids flopping on their beds and wearing their pajamas and little hoods with little ears on their pajamas. And we had to redirect them and say, this is a classroom. And in during this 45 minutes, you are in school. So we expect that kind of behavior and attention. Do you think that, I mean, you're talking about, Fran, getting these kids ready for high school and getting them into the schools that they want to get into, which are very competitive, I know. And Amy, you and Sandy are dealing with the colleges that they're trying to get into. Do you think there's going to be some kind of adjustment made in terms of what these schools are looking for from the kids, or is it just going to be the same because everybody went through the same period? What's going to happen in terms of expectations of GPA? Are you going to adjust your grading scales because they had a more difficult learning situation? What's going to happen in terms of their evaluation and grading systems? Well, I think, go ahead, Sammy. Sorry. For me, um, I'm not changing my grading. Um, I believe that there will be bumps in the road all the time, and you're going to have to figure out how to get over them. Uh, But I am giving my my students the tools to be able to continue to move forward, and I think they're really grateful for that. Um, But for the transition from high school to college, um, I believe there will be some changes. because a lot of the students, uh, AP testing, I believe they're still going to do that, just a little bit differently. Um, I did hear a little bit about the SAT and ACT testing, because those, I believe those aren't going to happen, right? You know? I think they canceled SAT. Um, AP is definitely still happening, happening, but it's going to be from home. They've cut about two units from most courses. And right. instead of multiple choice and a written response, they'll be doing all written response, and they get a shorter period of time to do it. But it's right. open book. It would never have been like that otherwise. In college. Exactly. In the college, I believe they um, they are waiving the SATs for those certain students, correct? I believe so. I know uh, the UC system has made a statement in the last week or two about how, they're, how they plan to handle it. But as the closures are extended, it, it's still very up in the air. And for us, for our high schools um, here in San Diego that some of the students are trying to get into, the HSPTs were given in January. So luckily, those are already um, had those already completed. So that's kind of a non-entity as far as uh, the entrance exams go. And California state testing is canceled for this yeah. year. Oh, okay, that's good. Well, now talk to me about this. I just said that I believe it is about two thirds of the LA Unified School District is below the poverty level, and a lot of those homes don't have computers, they don't have laptops, so they don't have online learning capabilities. So they're having to do this with a printed curriculum that they get from the school and the parents are not as educated as some of the other parents might be. What do you say to those parents about getting their child ready for the next grade, because I've always said our job as parents is to prepare the child for the next level of life. And here we've got children that perhaps were really relying on the school lunch program and all for food, and now that's gone away. So they're now relying on other programs like Feeding America and different programs to deliver meals to the home. They don't have the equipment that other students might have, but they're yet still expected to complete the work and be prepared for the next grade. How do you deal with that as a parent? Um, I would say keep communicating with the schools and the districts. They're really providing a lot of things that parents aren't aware are there. Uh, They're keeping a lot of the websites for the district updated. Our district decided to hand out lunch every day, not just to our students, but any student under 18 that shows up. Um, they're taking special precautions to make sure that that's done safely. They've done, uh, our, our principal required that we made packets for our students that could be picked up at the school in case they cannot get online. We're almost one-to-one on uh, 
technology with laptops in our in our district. Um, we don't have the students taking them home and checking them out previous to the closure, but now we're actually allowing them to come to the school on scheduled days and pick up laptops, multiple if they need, I believe, um, if they have multiple students in the household as well. Well, that's great. We have also been lending uh, uh, Chromebooks out to our families that don't have enough devices for their students, to, their children to be using. I know San Diego Unified is also giving out lunch, uh, meals, breakfasts and lunches to children still as, uh, as well. Same with Hesperia Unified. We are supplying lunches and all of our students are supplied with Chromebooks. Okay, so they all have a device to work from in your district. Yes. Uh huh. On a wider scale too, like Spectrum Internet was offering free service to anyone who needed it during this time period so students could continue learning. See, this is so valuable. I'm so glad to hear this. So we have providers that are providing internet access and the schools are providing notebooks of some sort, Chromebooks or whatever for the student to take home. So if they're willing to take the initiative to find out what the school has available, to get the equipment, to find out where they can register for internet, et cetera, et cetera, if a parent is tenacious enough, they can get some type of computer, some type of internet access, get into a school portal to have access to a teacher to help them to do what they need to do, they're not out there on their own if they'll take the initiative to find out what the resources are. You know, in the yeah, textbook, so it's, all about, it's all about communication, again. And whether it comes from administration or if it comes from the classroom teacher, we have to communicate and get that word out to those parents because they're busy and they're trying to work from home and they're dealing with their children and, it, and it's our job. And ladies, I'm sure you're working mega hours right now trying to make sure you get all of that information out to those families. That's taken up a huge part of everyone's time at this point. Absolutely. Yeah, that, I don't have children yet, but even my dog takes some time up. I think you guys might have seen him a minute ago, but it, it definitely takes time outside of the typical school hours. And I'm seeing a lot of teachers that are just really dedicating their time, putting their families back in. And it's mm -hmm. amazing to see what, what happens in education in this country. I sit right. here and have to mute my cell phone because my students won't stop messaging me. So <laughs> I understand that. You guys are my heroes. Teachers are my heroes today, I tell you. You guys are amazing. Yeah. Amy, I saw your dog. I want to know your dog's name. Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll I actually it. bring him in when my student, my AP uh, psych students are learning about learning, conditioning, and Pavlov. I bring him in during finals so they get to meet him and teach him a new trick every year. That's great. All right, now I've got a couple of questions for each of you. Amy, if you were sitting down with a group of parents and you were going to orient them, instruct them, pep talk them, all of that in one about how to approach homeschooling with their kids, give me that talk. What would you say to the parents if they were getting ready to undertake this homeschooling, what would you include? Well, I would remind them on, on two, two friends, I would want to make sure that they would understand that their students are capable. They are definitely able to do a lot of great things. Um, we see that in our classroom, so we know they can do it at home with the right support. Um, for parents, I would suggest that they just, again, stay involved and communicate, make sure they're looking at what resources are there but also to ask questions. I know for parents, it can be really intimidating to talk to teachers, especially if they didn't have good relationships with teachers when they were growing up. I've noticed that a lot. There's um, kind of that reluctance maybe to even ask questions. So I would just wanna make sure that they understand that we're here to support them, that they, uh, they have a lot that they can do to help their kids. Even if they don't know how to do that math problem, they can teach them the tenacity that it'll, it will take for them to be able to do that problem and help, help them find the resources they need, if not provide the answers. All right. Sandy, what would you say if you were talking to the parents? You were getting them ready, said, all right, first day's tomorrow. I want you to have this mindset going in. What would you tell them? Stay calm. That would be my main, my main thought, because a lot of parents in the beginning, I'm one of them, I have four children. Thank goodness they're all grown. But... The biggest thing is to stay sane because your fears are going to get the best of you. There are so many resources out there that you can use to help you. 
whether it be the teacher, the admin at your school, um, your neighbor next door, get on a phone call. I know we have lots of friends that are teachers of different subjects. Utilize all of those things. Um, YouTube, like I said, but the communication between you, your student and your teacher is very, very important. You can get a lot from that if you would just open up and ask the question. And Fran, give me your speech. Leave your guilt at the door. Don't, you can't keep thinking I'm not doing enough for my child. You can only do what you can do. And understand that your home is your home. It's never going to look like school. You have to find out what's going to work best for your family and for your child. Work together with that teacher to make learning happen. It's not going to look the same in every single household. And be kind to yourself. Be good to yourself. Okay, that's great from all three of you. Now, Fran, let me start with you and go back down the line. What would you say to the students? Because kids take feedback, criticism, coaching, whatever, usually better from non-parents. A neighbor, a teacher, a coach can tell a child something and it lands a lot better than coming from a parent just because of the familiarity and the closeness and all. But what would you tell a student to maximize this? We've got probably another 30 to 45 days of homeschooling here, and it matters to the student what the outcome is. What would you say to the student about their mindset, their attitude going forward in working with their parent, in doing the homeschooling so they finish this year out as well as possible? The first message is, we love you, we are proud of you, and you are not alone in this. And it's so important that they understand that we are proud of everything they've accomplished so far. Understand that they are not alone is huge because they feel they, feel they are physically alone at this point, uh, ostracized from their, from their classmates. So knowing that we're proud of them, knowing that they're supported by us in whatever way they need, and then knowing that we truly do care and, and love them. That's, that's it's emotionally, that's the best thing we can do to provide them with that emotional support. And Fran, is this, as far as the mandate to all of your teachers, you're the principal, but as far as the mandate for all of your teachers, is everybody working from home? They're still putting in the same amount of time, hours, and have the same accessibility as if they were at school? Yes, actually more. They're, they, they, the parents are emailing them at all hours of the night, and they are answering them. I don't expect them to answer them at all hours of the night, but teachers are a dedicated lot, and they do. Yeah, and I was giving you the lecture just a few days ago about sleeping with your phone and uh, answering twenty four seven. So I, I know the teachers are going over and above. So. I think that's a great message to the kids. Sandy, what would be your message for the next 45 days for these kids so the journey is as positive and productive as possible? You know, I just had this conversation with my students and I told them, let's go out with a bang. We don't have much more time before you graduate. Let's prove to them that we can get through this with no issues, no problems. Those of you that have C's right now, we're going to make them A's because right now you're going to prove yourself and you're going to fight and you're going to get through this because you know that I'm there for you and that if you need me at any time, I'll be there for you. And I always end every conversation with my students telling them that I love them. And I'm guessing they respond well to that kind of message from you. They do. I think they do. Amy, what would be your message to the students to maximize this next 45 days? I just want to remind them that the, the comeback should be greater than the setback, and they are more than capable of making that happen if they stay communicating and dedicate themselves and grieve when they need to grieve and work when they need to work. Uh, we're here to support that however we can. Um, it's a unique year having seniors who were literally born the year of 9-11. Um, I related that to them earlier this year and, and that I was a freshman when it happened and it really changed the course of my education and it's affecting even them today as a teacher. Now I see how it affects them 
And so I, I just wanted to remind them that they not only were born during an amazingly unique time in history, but now they're going out, like you said, Sandy, with a bang. Even though they're not getting the pomp and circumstance they deserve on time and schedule, it will happen. And we'll make sure that it does. Yeah, that's a great observation. It is. Well, you know, my message to parents and kids alike is that never in the history of this country has this ever happened before. And I don't believe that crises make heroes. I don't believe that crises make goats or cowards. I think what crises do is reveal who we really are. And, you know, it's like when Katrina hit in New Orleans. I was invited to come down there by the police chief and the fire chief because they were having a rash of suicides just within days of Katrina hitting down there because there was so much pressure on the first line responders. And so my airplane was the first one to get to land in New Orleans after Katrina. They literally cleaned the runway off so I could land there and come in. And down in that area, that ward where the waters were at rooftop, there was an old man that lived down there that nobody ever knew. It was an African-American gentleman that lived down there for years and years. Nobody ever knew him. He didn't ever speak to anybody. And there were people drowning in there, and they were all on their rooftops. And this gentleman in his 60s swam to half a dozen different rooftops and got people off and literally pulled them to safety. And on his last trip to get someone, he drowned. And he saved like nine, ten people's lives down there and turned out to be a true hero that just sat on that corner in his house all those years and nobody knew it. And they said, you know, what a hero he was in that situation. The truth is there was a hero living on that corner all of those years. He was just revealed when that happened. And when we get into unusual situations, it gives us the opportunity to show who we are, to really reveal who we are. And You know, I say to parents, you may never have a better opportunity to step up as a parent than you have right now because your child is in an unusual situation. I mean, their school has closed down. They're they're not allowed to go to the building. They're not allowed to do the things that they would ordinarily do all the other years, and you have the opportunity to close that gap for them. You can be frustrated, you can be critical, you can lose your cool, you can criticize everything that they do and have a breakdown, or you can say, you know what, this is a time that whatever my personality is, if it's perfectionistic or if it's intolerant or I tend to be explosive or whatever, this is a time that you can say, you know what, I need to put that aside Because this isn't about me, it's about my child. And this is the time for me to put their needs ahead of my own. If I've never done that before, this is a time I can do that. And this is a time where 10 years from now, 15 years from now, they can look back and say, you know what? We might have had a rocky relationship, but when I got in that tight and I needed to get that year finished, all of a sudden, they changed. They stepped up and did what I needed to have done for me at that time. And I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden, the impatience went away, the criticism went away, the judgment went away, and they just hung in there with me, and they got that done with me for 45 days. And if you give that gift to your children, I can't tell you how much that will mean to them across time. And kids, I'm telling you, if you choose this to say, you know what, I can find excuses to slide or I can look for opportunities to shine, this is your chance to do that. No question there's less accountability here. There just is. I mean, you can say there's not, but there is. There's less accountability here because you're not in as structured an environment as you would. 
but you'll figure this out like I did in college. The day will come when you realize that you're going to school not for your parents, not for your teachers, but for you. Because in the not-too-distant future, you're going to be selling the information that you're now learning. You're going to be using this information to provide for your children and for yourself to determine your quality of life. You might as well come to that realization now. This information you're gaining, you're going to be selling in a competitive market very, very soon. So at some point, you're going to decide you're going to school for you, not anybody else. It might as well be now that you make that decision. So make it now. And I really encourage parents and students alike to get up every morning just like you did when we weren't in a lockdown situation. Get up, shower, groom, get dressed, just like you would if you were leaving the house to go to work or school, and conduct yourself as much that way as you can. Maintain as much normalcy and routine as you possibly can. If you would be at school at 8 o'clock or 8.15, be ready for school at 8 o'clock or 8.15. Go to an area in the house where you would do it. Get your books out. Do your work. Hold yourself to that standard, and you will be a whole lot better off. And parents, maintain that routine. You don't want to walk around looking like a slug, not shaving, not doing your hair, not getting dressed all day. Because if you do... When we finally end this and you have to transition back into the world, it's going to be more of a dramatic transition than if you spend every day getting up, getting dressed, grooming yourself, and acting the same way you did before. You don't want to go from zero to 60. You want to go from 55 to 60. Be ready by getting yourself as normalized as you possibly can. And that's true with schoolwork, with getting everything as normalized as possible. And if you'll do that, and you've heard some great messages today, you know, use YouTube as a tool, talk to your teachers, use office hours they have for parents, do all of this together and get through this. The resources are there if you'll just use them. So, you know, that's my message. And I really hope people will hear that and use this. This is a time to shine, not a time to be frustrated. Any final comments from any of you guys? Thank you. Thank you so much for recognizing the hard work of all these professionals, because that's what they are, the professionals. Thank you so much. Thank Amy, you Sandy, us anything from you guys? To give parents and students the peace of mind that they need to get through this together. You bet. And I want to thank you for doing this and bringing us into this, but I also want to thank our school districts because we have had a ton of support and it is making my job that much easier. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. And you guys that have followed me at all know that I am a huge fan and advocate of every teacher, everybody in the education system. I think we pay teachers an embarrassingly low amount of money for a critically important role in the shaping of our children's minds, personalities, and lives. I've seen so many teachers that despite being paid so little, if they ever sat down and got a calculator and figured out how much they're getting per hour, it would just be even more shameful than it is. I've seen teachers that work damn near around the clock, get so little pay, and then get in their own pockets to buy materials for their classroom, to bring in extra things for their students out of what little pay they get. They buy things themselves to enhance their classrooms. And I'm just such a fan of teachers, and I admire every one of y'all for doing what you're doing. And I thank you for participating today and giving these tips and messages to all the parents that are looking at 30 to 45 days left and parents and students alike. So I hope people will hear this and I hope they'll use it and make a difference. So guys, thank you so much. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. All right. So long. Thank you.